And today it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Paul Grant. Dr. Grant received his PhD in history at UW Madison in 2017. He is a lecturer both in the history department at UW Madison and at North Park Theological Seminary in Chicago, where he teaches world Christian history at the graduate level. He has published peer reviewed articles and book chapters on global Christianity and related topics, and has presented his work at several national and international academic conferences. His book entitled Healing and Power in Ghana was published last year by Baylor University Press. It was a finalist for the American Academy of Religion's first book award. And as of September last month, it was on the Library Journal's bestseller list for academic African studies. He is currently working on two books. My hat is off. Uh, I have enough trouble getting one book fun, uh, finished, so I'm, I really admire him for his efforts. His first book is a biography of David Quasi Cornelius Badu, a 19th century Ghanaian man who was born in Almina and lived in Angola, Congo, Cameroon, Nigeria, German, uh, Germany, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. For this book project, Dr. Grant received a, re a research grant from the American Historical Association for Archival Research in Cameroon. His second book is a long durée study entitled Receiving African Christianity, A Global History, for which he was also awarded a research fellowship, uh, which will start in uh, 2022 next year at uh, Leuven University in Belgium, which as Paul reminded me is Jan van Sina's alma mater. Uh, Paul lives in Madison and has three children aged 10 to 15. So my admiration for his work grows uh, knowing that. Uh, in the talk you'll be giving today, uh, whose title is Making Christianity African in Pre-Colonial Ghana, Paul will share some of the findings from his 2020 book, Healing and Power in Ghana, Please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Paul Grant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis. And I was saying to, uh, to Aaliyah and, and others beforehand, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've been coming to Africa at noon for many years. Uh, back in the 1990s, I was an, uh, an undergrad here and I, they had free food and I would show up whenever there was free food. And so it's uh, nice to be able to give something back every, every, after every so often. Um, the, one of the things that's great about Africa at noon is that it just brings in such an interdisciplinary group of people from all over, from every, every different field that's represented at the university here. And while I'm talking mostly from, uh, from uh, about history, from a 19th century situation here, um, what I've always appreciated is when people can bridge two different fields. And so I want to talk, uh, start the, 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 the discussion here um, at literature, at the level of, of Chino Achebe's 19, 8, 1960 novel, No Longer at Ease. And you have this moment here, kind of halfway through the book, where the main character, a fellow by the name of Obia Conquo, who is the grandson of the main character in, in, um, in, in uh, Things Fall Apart, but Obia Conquo returns home to Lagos, where he has a clerical job in dismay. It's set in around 1957. Somewhere. And he, he returns home in dismay because he has gotten into a dispute with his father. And his father is a, a, um, a retired Anglican evangelist. And Obi had gone to ask his father for permission to marry a young woman named Clara. And he and, and he'd gotten uh, the negative, uh, the, the, the no, you can't marry her. And the reason is, is because this Clara is of the forbidden, a, a sort of a ritually forbidden caste of people called Osu in, in, in uh, no longer at ease. And although Clara's father, uh, and is um uh, is a Christian man by the name of Josiah, who incidentally the name comes from the uh, from the ancient Israelite king who had overthrown sacrificial altars, and this man Josiah had dedicated his new life to the new religion, in the same way that Obiakonko's own father Isaac had done, and I Isaac had paid a steep personal cost for his own conversion. Isaac is still not going to allow his son Obi to marry Clara, so. Obi uh, uh, counters his father and saying, here's why you should allow me to marry this woman. And he does so you are referring to the Bible, referring to Christian scriptures in which there's a sacrificial moment, a human sacrifice, uh, vice, Jesus on the cross. And he says, this trumps all of our human denominations. And the father remains dubious. He remains unmoved. And he says, my son, I understand what you're saying, but this thing is deeper than you think. So in essence, in this, this, anecdote, 
uh, set and uh, written in, in composed in the year 1960. Um, but and uh, in, in essence here, Isaac Okonkwo is acknowledging defeat. He's 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 conceding defeat that the faith to which he has dedicated his entire life is powerless where it matters most. It's powerless as a vehicle for power over the unseen world. Isaac Okonkwo's Christian God is lame and therefore irrelevant. Now, with all respect, due respect to Chino Achebe and the incredible creativity and insights that he had both into the human condition, but also into the, the very specifics of his time and day, this line of thought was nevertheless quite conventional uh, for this, this time, the 1950s, and quite conventional. And the consensus of Africanist scholarship in both in Europe and North America of the 1960s, of which uh, we uh, in the, uh, the UW-Madison are partly an heir, and the consensus at the time was that, especially in West Africa, where indigenous Christians had in certain places become a, a significant part and in certain parts is even a majority of the population, it was nevertheless, the consensus was that at that time, Christianity was irreducibly foreign irreducibly foreign and therefore destined for some kind of reckoning or even decline once the colonial prop goes away. Now, in fact, the opposite happens. Now, switching gears from, from uh, Achebe's Lagos to Ghana here, millions of people around the 19, uh, from the 1960s forward, so uh, up to the 21st century, found themselves affiliating with Christian movements throughout across, across the region. It was almost as if this colonial prop that had held up, had sponsored uh, uh, sort of foreign missionary Christianity, it's almost as if this prop had actually functioned not as a prop, but as a throttle. And so once you removed that colonial throttle, the engine took off in a direction in directions that was on, that were the uh, the and, and colonialists and the missionaries themselves could neither control nor foresee. A religious change of world historical scale was underway from the beginning in the 1960s, 70s, and so on. We don't know where it's going to end up. There's weird things happening and new innovations ever, uh, sprouting up every single day. Moreover, since the 1970s, at least in Ghana, the lion's share of this growth has accrued not to the ranks of the missionary-derived churches, the Methodists and Catholics and the Presbyterians, but to the so-called Pentecostal, sometimes called born-again movements. Now, a few of these churches are foreign in origin, and a few of them are indigenous, but nearly all of them are self-led, self-funded, and self-propagating. So not much else defines or unifies uh, Guinean Pentecostals, and even the term itself is not always useful because sometimes there's Pentecostal impulses in the Catholic, in the uh, Methodist churches. So it's not, the term itself is certainly not very useful at the level of abstract teaching or, 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 um, or, or theology. A better approach to think to defining West African or at least Ghanaian Pentecostalism is more in practice than in theory, right? Nearly all Ghanaian Pentecostals seek to see real, tangible, benefits right now in the form of power over both over the unseen world of spirits, over hatred, over confusion, over sin, and over the equally invisible uh, a hand of global capitalism and so on, and over the visible and tangible world of sickness, poverty, political violence, and sometimes even military power. Now, there's quite a bit of diversity under the rubric of Pentecostalism. Now, but while the global sort of the stereotype you'll read about in sorry, The Economist or so on uh, has um, a Nigerian mega church of 80, 90 or 100,000 members under the leadership of some big man, uh, the reality, of course, is that it's, it's quite diverse. Some of these congregations are rich, some are poor, some speak French and English and others African languages, including some small and marginalized ones. Some are middle class or, or above, operate like businesses with growth plans and strategic leadership initiatives, and others are chaotic personality led and sometimes out of control. All of which is to say that in the last 40 years or so, give or take, tens of millions of men and women across the region have embraced an expression of Christianity in which healing and power 
are understood as visible manifestations of reality, spiritual reality. And again, to go back to Achebe, this was not generally expected at, from, at least in the uh, academic centers in the, in the West. Many, if most, uh, enough, not most scholars writing at the same time as Chinua Achebe anticipated Christianity to grow perhaps peripheral to African life, culture, and politics. Um, and there was a great deal of uh, disagreement about this. And so to get to the situation, why is something that's so uh, sort of um, uh, the, the dominant expression of the, of the day was very sort of peripheral to the radar screen uh, 60 years ago. It demands some historical thought. So now I switch gears over to a histor as a historian. There are two, if you look at the literature, there are basically, uh, both in sociology, looking at the recent past and a little bit longer into the 20th century and so on, you see basically two uh, schools of thought about the sort of historical origins of these changes. The first points to sort of in, uh, um, institutional lineages and global flows of personnel and money. And they've correctly pointed out that Pentecostalism arrives in West Africa as a foreign religion. Right. It came early in the 20th century in the form of a smattering of individuals, and again, uh, in a second wave in the post-colonial period with a great deal, a little more confidence and more energy. And in fact, most Pentecostal congregations in Ghana date to the second wave. Most Pentecostal congregations are less than 50 years old, and nearly all of them operate with some kind of transnational mental imaginary, though. They, they see the world as their stage, um, but they also see international connections as currency and as something that is to be dealt with at the, super, uh, at the, at the spiritual level. So that's one way of school of thought, looking at sort of institutional lineages and, and global flows of money. There's an alternative approach focused more on culture and sociology. And these people, these, these scholars tend to ask, why has Pentecostalism uh, been, been able to attract such an enormous membership? Now, partly from the, these new members are partly coming from the ranks of indigenous religions and even Islam on occasion, but a lot of these members are actually just transferring from existing Christian churches, such as the, the, the Presbyterians and Methodists and so on. So these, the, if, if one group of people are making a correct observation that the institutional lineage of, of, of 20th century Pentecostalism is foreign, uh, the other group focused more on, on, uh, <clears throat> on culture are, ma are making an all, uh, equally correct observation, which is that these new uh, these Pentecostals are able to speak in terms that, that are that they're intelligible against indigenously defined, felt needs. Above all, a pr protection from evil, power over the unseen, healing, wealth, and so on. So then the question is, can is there a way to reconcile these two on their face correct observations that on the one hand, this it arrives from overseas, and on the other hand, um, uh, that within a few short years, these, uh, these uh, indigenous Pentecostal churches were in fact able to attract a far greater followership than the missionaries had been able to do over a century. All right. So a few observe, a few astute observers in, especially in Ghana and Nigeria, have noted the conspicuous parallels uh, go to a, a different group of people between the sort of early 20th century so-called African initiated churches, including in, in Chinua Achebe's um, Lagos, the cherubim and seraphim, they feature actually at the next page in that books that I was talking about. Uh, in, in, in Belgian Congo, you're talking about Simone Kimbangu, uh, and, and in uh, Ivory Coast, William Wade Harris. Even in Ghana, in, in, in the Gold, Gold Coast, you have somebody named Samson Otapong. Some of these initiated religions who are these um, generally uh, excluded by the, the uh, sort of European controlled churches. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. In the case of the Belgian Congo, they, they basically imprisoned some of these prophets and so on. However, uh, a number of recent scholars in um, uh, recent scholars and theologians in West Africa, uh, Christian scholars have said, you know what, even though these people were excluded, they were tapping into something, they were tapping into a felt need that existed pr uh, uh, prior to the arrival of Pentecostalism. And so if you want to look to the origins of, or, or maybe an explanation for why so many people joined Pentecostal churches late in the 20th century, you might do well to look further back than, than, than the institutional arrival, look back to these African-initiated congregations. 
my core argument here is that you go, you look, go, you can go back even further, a half century further, uh, to the late pre-colonial period in Ghana, to the middle of the 19th century, and that story constitute uh, the the story that I want to talk about here is is one of an, a homegrown intellectual breakthrough, as um, men and women of the Gold Coast experimenting with a religion that they had known perhaps only superficially for centuries, they in developed some compelling applications for Christianity that the missionaries did not have on offer. But they nevertheless were able to uh, answer problematic gaps in the existing indigenous ritual toolkits. So zooming back even more centuries here, you can say Christianity may be said to ar have arrived in what is now Ghana, in what is what now Southern Ghana, in the late 1400s, the 1480s, as the religion of the Portuguese. Now, whereas in West Central Africa, in, in Angola above all, indigenous experimentation with or reformulation with or talk back to Portuguese religion, it begins very early in the 1600s and so on, nearly nothing of that sort happens in Ghana. Over the course of 550 years of encounter with Christianity, Men and women of what is now Ghana have consistently insisted that Christianity be relevant to their felt needs, their pressing needs, as defined on their own terms, and finding it otherwise have consistently rejected it. Which is to say that over if if, if, if your your choices are either to uh, receive this foreign religion, to reject it wholesale, or to reformulate it over the the, the biggest stretch of time. Ghanaians have consistently rejected it as long as they can, is, it remains foreign to their felt needs. Now, this kind of reformulation that I'm talking about is where it gets more interesting. But that's exactly what happens in a, a particular uh, locality in late pre-colonial Ghana in the third quarter of the 19th century. So I'm going to pull up my map here. And... Um, Pardon me. All right. So just uh, as a, all right, um, as a, just a regional thing, I'm, I, I show, this is a, a, a map of, of, of a German atlas from the, uh, from the um, late 1800s. Uh, but here is the, the Gold Coast of, of Ghana. You see the, the big uh, blue line coming down at the diagonal. That's the Volta River, it, and, and uh, it comes from, from the north. You've got this um, uh, the sort of toward the bottom right, uh, bottom left here, you have a cluster of, of small uh, cities collectively part of Accra in the present day. And most of the action that I'm going to be talking about takes place a little bit to the north of there. You have a, a, a string of mountains called the Aquapem Mountains, sometimes called the Aquapem Ridge and so on. It is an independent kingdom at this point uh, in, the, in the 1800s and it remains sort of a, a, a state in Ghana to this day. It's not far off from Accra, you can get there on the highway, depending on traffic, in maybe a half hour at the time, it was a couple of days of hike. But the uh, the topography is quite abrupt. It's this mountain mountainous area, and the mountains feature very importantly here because it it basically amounted to a de good degree of isolation from some of the endemic warfare that's going on in the at this time. Now, you know. The next slide here is a, a little bit of more of a close up here. Um, and uh, so uh, Accra down here, I, I love this, how the, the British fort is called Jamestown and the, uh, the Germans uh, call it Jamestown. Uh, but it's just as a little, hold that as a little reminder here, but you go up here into the mountains and um, you get to uh, this, this ridge here and there's a string of villages right along the ridge here. And then at the core of the ridge here, the, the two different colors are all, all one single kingdom, but they basically represent different language groups. And I'll get to this in a second. But the uh, core activity here fo uh, focuses on the, the royal city of Akrapong and a little bit along this line, this, 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 line, this road here to the south is uh, the, the crest of the ridge. And I'll also mention the town of Tutu a little bit to the southwest of Akrapong. It was in Akrapong that 
uh, begin in the, the third quarter of the 19th century that locals, local Christians and non-Christians began embarking on a pervasive and sustained attempt to take control over a, a, um, a religious message that had been existing in Aquapam in the form of German speaking missionaries, mostly small town farmers from rural Southwestern Germany and Northwestern Switzerland. These people had arrived in Aquapam in the, in the 1830s, uh, 25 years earlier, and they'd spent 25 years in, in, in the region, essentially attaining very little conversion or, or only a few, few people. Indeed, some of these missionaries, these so-called Basel mission named after the city in Switzerland right on the German border, many of these, um, more, more, in the first few years, more of these missionaries died than Africans uh, joined their congregation. Now these missionaries were cut from a very different cloth than the English missionaries. They were farmers. They were, they were rural villagers from uh, sort of impoverished backwaters in southwestern Germany for the most part. They were, they were um, they in many cases had not been uh, privileged to go, they had never gone to cities, they had never seen uh, railroads or anything like that. And they learned they, they were able to identify with the locals in many ways. They were able to talk about livestock and about crops for hours on end and be happy doing so. So um, uh, these, local, these, these Basel missionaries learned the local languages more than any other missionaries before or after. At least the early generation of these people tend to be, the, the, there's, a, uh, there's a gap here we'll get to in a second. The later generation who come in the colonial period, uh, nobody remembers them with any kind of fondness, but these early ones who came in, these, these farmer types who identified with the locals, they saw local healers when they, to deliver their babies and so on, they, they, they are held in high esteem. Uh, to this day, and not so the English. The people hold the English in, 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 in contempt, but, uh, but um, Aquapam at this time, when these people arrive, is a politically marginal and socially and linguistically pluralistic state. It's the southeasternmost entity of the so-called Akan region. Aquapam is, uh, in the early 19th century, characterized by a sort of a pluralism. The, the, the royal family and, and several villages are speak the language of Chi. It's a, the, a, the royal family had arrived a century earlier from the West. And you've got a, a, a um, Chi speaking matrilineal ruling class, um, ruling clan, I should say, it, living with sort of an uncomfortable coexistence with the indigenous people, the Guan, who were and remain in the present day patrilineal and whose religious and ritual paradigms centered on tutelary spirits, territorial spirits, and ruler priests. They're quite different from one another. Incidentally, I use the word indigenous. It's an awkward fit here because the ruling families, the, the, the Ghanaians, the, the, their, uh, their chief speakers, they're not indigenous. They have come a century earlier and so sometimes I use the word local and sometimes I use the word indigenous because it's a bit of an awkward fix, uh, fit for, for everything. It's a bit of a mess. And it does serve to remind us, though, that notions of purity, ethnic purity, authenticity, and so on are simply not on the agenda in this corner of the world. There are, uh, we're here on sort of these borderlands between major traditions and uh, you, you're going to find in other parts of the world, in India and China and, and other parts of Africa, language of authenticity and ethnic purity are much more important than they are in Aquapam. Aquapam was and remains politically, religiously, and socially fragmented and was correspondingly rarely able to mount successful defenses against outside menaces, which in the mid-19th century meant, above all, the Asante. The Asante kingdom regularly overran Aquapam to pillage, sometimes to steal goods, sometimes to steal people. Nevertheless, Aquapam remains something of a mountainous redoubt. It's their topography was their biggest defense. Relatively poor soil, above all, no gold to be found in the soil at all, and thus Aquapam was rarely worth the invaders' trouble. The most important exception to Aquapem's co uh, continuing string of defeats uh, at the hands of the Asante was a fairly big one, which came in 1828 when the Asante engaged the, uh, the Aquapem in, in battle and the uh, Aquapem managed to uh, capture a talisman, the so-called Ojira, 
which the Ashante had carried into battle. Now this talisman now became the property of the Aquapem, or perhaps you could say it the other way around, now they belonged to the Ojira. But either way, Aquapem then instituted an, a, a festival built around the nexus of the yam harvest and ancestral veneration with the office of the king at the fulcrum of the spiritual and temporal worlds. It became the defining ritual of the kings and it was their primary attempt to unify a kingdom that was always at risk of falling to pieces because of the plurality and so on. But this, this talisman was a, 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 a added to, uh, an addition to the ritual toolkit that helped hold the country together. There's something else, and that is that uh, the times were changing, all right? So the British were embargoing the slave trade. Uh, slave trade, of course, had lasted for, for centuries here, and now the British are ex imposing some kind of an external embargo on this. And simultaneously, there is a spectacular increase in European demand for palm oil, all right? Uh, and this is a surge people are using, demanding palm oil and the surge of palm oil has as a consequence that forest lands heretofore mainly used for hunting or wood cutting suddenly become valuable in their own right. So oil palm plantations sprouting up all over through the forest has as a consequence that warfare, the, the, the definition of wealth is changing. Warfare switches in focus from armies uh, steel uh, trying to, uh, uh, to steal oil bearing lands from one another. Right. Put all of these changes together and you have the makings of human emergency in the form of refugees flooding the mountains in greater numbers than the existing political, social, religious infrastructure, including the Ojira, can handle. Now, you have a, an existing toolkit of, of, um, of ritual options for handling various stresses both the intimate ones such as failing marriages or failing crops to bigger protocols for how do you speak to unknown, previously unknown gods? How do you incorporate strangers into existing clans and so on? Ideally, every stranger, regardless of their social position is going to be incorporated into a clan. And this is, process is religiously significant and could take place in several different ways we can't get into right now, but almost all of the vehicles for incorporating strangers into a clan in this re region at this point involve sacrifice at one level or another. Brought in, sacrifice brought in before the existing spiritual overseers of the community spirits or ancestors. Now, how you do this varies a great deal. How you incorporate a, a, an impoverished person, a slave, a refugee is different than how you incorporate somebody who's of high standing, who's able to bring perhaps an ancestral uh, shrine with them uh, and so on. It's easier to incorporate somebody who's in good health than somebody who is diseased or haunted. And it's certainly easier to in incorporate an individual than to an entire village, all right? What, another intellectual cultural framework, sort of a meta framework for the region for problem solving is that of re-importation and reconfiguration of existing religions, right? The basic outlook is that is, is empirical rather than theor theoretical or theological, which is that if one God fails, one praxis fails, another is going to be brought in. Right, this ambivalence about authenticity or purity is it's um it's very important to, to bear this in mind because there's never a sense in importing a, a, a new religion or, or switching religions or a new cult or so on. There's no, never a sense that there's anything of a false consciousness or cultural appropriation or double masking or whatever else going on. The, I, the, those are simply not important questions. The really important question was what worked. Then one final toolkit, a, a tool in the, in the ritual toolkit that I need to bring in here is the shrine sanctuary. A shrine sanctuary is a situation in which an endangered individual can attach themselves to a spirit shrine, essentially signing themselves over to the, 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 the shrine's priest steward. Now there are a handful of uh, sanctuary shrines in the region, including one along the top of the ridge in the village of Tutu, about a half hour's walk from Accra Pump. Now the problem is that in the mid, in the endemic warfare of, of these middle uh, uh, middle century decades, which saw entire districts put to flight, ritual incorporation is harder to pull off. There simply were too many people, too desperate for the clans to absorb, and some of them too sick to heal. The ritual apparatus 
which was intensely relational, simply couldn't keep up with demand. And so some of the refugees found themselves being abused by lo powerful local men. Um, the shrine sanctuary at Tutu was also being swamped. In short, the mid 19th century Akopem, the existing ritual toolkit began to fail. Uh, so great and varied were the demands being put on it. And at this point, the, the locals began experimenting with Christianity to see if they could put it to some use. All right. So what you see that, again, I, I mentioned this before, but Christianity has a longer tenure in Ghana than nearly any other place in coastal West Africa. We're talking hundreds of years. But unless, through most of this time, Ghanaians have found the group of religion irrelevant. And unless we under, appreciate the, this, this overwhelming sense that Christianity is irrelevant or even offensive in the case of the slave trade, uh, it might be easy to, to, uh, to, to view the change here uh, in the 1860s as, some, as relating to, as, as being driven by the missionaries. And in fact, the missionaries wrote about it and it became part of the story. Right? But the reality is, is that the missionaries have been trying and knocking and, and, and experimenting for centuries or for decades and got nothing. And only when the European, when the, um, the, uh, the, um, the um, Ghanaians began experiment, I'm using the, the uh, a, a, um, chron chronological messed up word here, but the locals began uh, doing this. They, they began um, finding uses that they could put to this, uh, put th this foreign religion. Now, uh, one thing that I've got to sort of um, address here is, is just, um, again, the, the important thing is that this is taking place in the Chi language. This is important because very few Europeans did this, right? So the Basel mission um, came to uh, view that the nothing is not going to be, the no Christianity is going to be genuine or authentic as long as it is in European languages. It has to be in indigenous languages. And correspondingly, they learned local languages, but also be, as they began to talk, uh, they, they began to uh, sort of look for cognate terms. And sometimes they came upon cognate terms of the indigenous existing uh, ritual apparatuses and, and people, staff, and so on. But the locals consistently imposed their own terms on here. One of the examples here is the uh, that of the priests, these shrine priests, Asofu. All right, the Asofu, the shrine priests. Um, they, the locals began determining that these missionaries were a new class of shrine priests. And this was really offensive to the missionaries because they viewed themselves as arch rivals with the shrine priests, or the, the, the shrine priests were, they, they called them fetish priests. But the locals were unanimous from the very beginning that these missionaries were simply shrine priests, uh, also full of a new class of, of religion. And this they knew what to do with because you, if you, there's a new religion coming in, you can experiment, put it to work, see if it will bring us healing and power. All right. So these, these Basel missionaries had some ways of understanding this. And again, you've got to understand this divergence. They were not necessarily a, a British or even German rationalists or enlightenment types. They practiced divination in their own faith. They practiced uh, sort of faith healings and so on. So they were able to understand what was happening. And in that case, they were more receptive to the impositions uh, that were being demanded of them, all right? Now, they also published a lot they wrote everything down. They sent everything down into to their home office. But there's a twist in the sources here. And let me pull this back up again. There's a twist in the sources, which is that let me see here if it's going to let me advance. All right, here is a, um, a handwriting from one of the indigenous pastors. All right, now they wrote everything down and sent sent it by post to the home office. But, um, and nearly all historical books published in English or um, the, in, about Ghana will use the Basel Mission Archives, but they almost always use the sources that are published. And this is important. This, the reason is simply because um, it, it'll say, here is a letter from missionary so-and-so, so and it's much easier to read than, than the handwriting. Well, it might take you a whole day to, dis, to sort of decode one single thing. But 
in the process of writing on this book, I discovered that the, the home office is systematically deleting or censoring the content of these home letters. And more importantly, and so they're only what is, is being passed off in the published newsletter as a letter from Acropong is actually a small excerpt from a letter from Acropong. And more importantly, the most in, uh, in tantalizing details are the ones that are being left off, the parts that are most spiritually intense, confusing, emotionally upsetting, uh, and they're most likely the parts that are most likely to demonstrate missionary weakness, missionary subjectivity to indigenous imposition. As an example, 1863, one German missionary writes about an aborted invasion of Aquapem by the Asante. Right, everybody had been afraid. The local congregations began repeatedly claiming Psalm 50, which is a wartime psalm of King David's, call on me in your need and I will deliver you and you will praise me. Right, so the locals began reciting this one and it worked. The Ashanti army retreated unannounced and went home. This was a shockwave in Akopem in 19, 1863. And the missionary wrote that everybody had, all the locals had the impression that the local Christians had driven away the Ashanti with the help from God. Right? So the impression here is, uh, that does, not, does not show up in the published uh, letter. It was just simply deleted from the letter. Right. Next one was more important, more important in a different way, rewinding about five, five years. 1858, you have a resurrection of a dead child. Right. This is this is like everyone you pause at this point. A resurrection of a dead child. It had been performed in public during this child's funeral service in a village uh, on, on an adjacent ridge in which no missionaries were present, only an indigenous preacher named Samson Amadi who had done this. And it was this event. I don't take a position on, on what actually happened there, but it was a political shock and it, or along the whole ridge, it constituted sort of a, a political challenge to the existing uh, authorities, but it went entirely unreported in the missionary publications. A dead child had come back to life, but the missionaries wrote about it in, the, in the, their letter here, but what was published in the newsletter was, we've been trying to build a new house and we were able to buy some new lumber for the rafters. So they'd left out, but like the most, like what's really happening? Oh, the main thing that we ha happened was that a child came to life from the dead. But the main thing that we were writing about is that they're buying lumber uh, from the woods. All right, now uh, six years after that invasion, so in the late 1860s, another uh, example here, and this one kind of gets to what that intellectual process underway. The Ashanti, uh, Ashanti came uh, back to encamp at the base of the hills once again, and the Ashanti would not be able to um, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the authorities, the, 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 the Christian congregations called down the armies of heaven using the Hebrew word Sabaoth to drive off the Ashanti. All right, so what you have here is an assertion written in a hand let, uh, letter home that there was some kind of battle in the unseen world that the God of, of heaven's armies and they're using the Hebrew word here, um, has driven off this invading army. But when they write this, the home office deletes that entirely. And they just talk about uh, um, sort of a, um, some very pedestrian things about what happened at school. Such editorial discomfort with the miraculous is not out of the ordinary. Right, but but it, it's 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 characteristic. While the, the the home office contains all kinds of miraculous or charismatic claims, the the published sources will delete them consistently. And so, for this reason, a history of Ghanaian Christianity will remain distorted as long as we rely on the published missionary sources to the exclusion of some of the other sources, including the handwritten correspondence. However, demonstrations of spiritual authority over evil, such as the uh, you know calling down fire from heaven against the Ashanti, are simply expected by the local Christians. This was the currency of the local religious landscape or, or, or spiritual market. In any case, they could read it out of the Bibles, right? It, the, the supernatural features, these are stories that they're reading out of the Bibles anyway. So to quote a, uh, a contemporary uh, Ghanaian uh, uh, theologian named Kwame Bediako, the vernacular Bible, the vernacular use of the Bible became an independent yardstick by which to test and sometimes to reject uh, what the missionaries are teaching and practicing. 
So now I have to turn to the Bible then. What's going on here? The reason this is so important in this dynamic is because it's taken seriously by everybody in the scene here. It's being taken seriously by everybody, and yet um, uh, it rarely features in, in historiography. I don't know why. But um, not only did the, uh, the Bible began to be translated into Qi, and the, that was one of two important decisions that the Basel missionaries made. To translate the Bible into Qi very early on, this you do not see this happening in Fante country with the Methodists. You do not see this as much. But the much bigger decision was that they used indigenous speakers to do this translation. This was not an overnight process. You had to raise people up and not just teaching, tra they're not translating the Bible from German. They are bringing indigenous pastors to Switzerland for years of study in Hebrew and Greek, and then they are translating the Bible from those things, so that from, from the original languages. So when, over the following decade, these indigenous preachers began uh, systematically translating the Bible, and two of the three editors were Ghanaian and of, uh, from royal families, um, they, they, they are beginning, they, they're working to find ways to translate, for example, the Psalms into analogous meters or pa patterns of praise that you might find in the palaces or at shrines. And incidentally, this pattern uh, uh, continues in the present day. If you go to uh, your sort of uh, any number of, of theological seminaries in Ghana and you, you sort of go over the, these the bookshelves of the list of dissertations, they call them theses, that have been published in the last 20 years, you'll see overwhelming share of sort of theological publications are in conversation with the Hebrew Old Testament and only a, a fewer of those uh, re referring to the Greek and the New Testament. Very few people in Aquapam converted to Christianity for the reasons that the missionaries had on offer. The missionaries came announcing that, um, that there's forgiveness of sins, and nobody cares because nobody thinks of themselves as sinners. All right. The locals wanted something different. They wanted protection from evil. Now, one interesting quirk here in the, the Bible that these, these uh, indigenous Christians had translated was that both, both sin and evil, are rep which are represented in Greek by two different words, hamarsia for sin, kakos for evil, they are rendered in chi as a single word, bene, all right, which is to say that God will forgive your sins, nobody cares, aha, but God will, for, will protect you from evil, right, so that's, that became something that people are interested in. Some, these kinds of spiritual demands make sense within the local religious ecosystem in which the king and the priests, vis-a-vis -vis the ancestors and shrine spirits respectively, stand in the place of danger in order to make intercession with very powerful creatures. Indigenous Christian de demands, or even non-Christian demands, uh, on the missionaries include requests for physical healings, inclusion for disabled, handicapped people, disfigured people, or otherwise uh, sort of uh, repulsive people, they might, they're the alcoholics and so on. They are, there's a consistent demand for protection from bad spirits, and they could read these things straight out of their Bibles, but these were not on the agenda of the home office, who was caring by mid-century, beginning to care a whole lot more about their level of respectability in bourgeois Germany, right? But what's happening on the field is a completely different, on a completely different register. So let me wrap this up with just one little case study, one little example from December of 19, 1868. All right. And the Basel mission is consecrating a chapel in the village of Tutu. And there are several hundred refugees in this town who are sheltering in this town from the Ashanti. This constitutes a humanitarian crisis, although they didn't use that word at this time, because neither the king in Akrapong nor the sanctuary shrine in Tutu could handle the numbers of desperate people. So thus, they have this, they build this new building and this new chapel, and instead of just a, you know, a handful of the people who will go to that church, you have seven or 800 people show up. Now, the ceremony begins with somebody reading uh, the psalm, uh, the, uh, the song, this ancient song uh, from, from Hebrew in um, Psalm 84 in Chi translation. Now, this is a psalm in which the Israelite, uh, about the Israelite temple. So they're making an analogy here between the temple and this new building that they're uh, instituting. And they use the word, to translate the word God, the, the word Jehovah, Yahweh, they use the word Onyankompol, which basically is the high God who is the creator. 
So there's identifying the God that you're reading out of the Bible as an existing deity who's already been known as part of the, the language, part of the religious idiom and always has been, right? But the Psalm in, in she goes, blessed are those who live in your house. Blessed are those who recognize your power. They will attain victory upon victory. Now, for anyone who has any passing familiarity with contemporary West African Pentecostalism, this language of victory upon victory will be very familiar, right? Because the idiom of much of, of Pentecostalism focuses on victory and power. So after this, this public reading here, four preachers get up, right? And they preach, uh, preach sermons in succession. A German, a Ghanaian, a German, and a Ghanaian. And the contrast between these four sermons is absolutely delicious as an expression of worldview. Right? The first one comes up is this German by the name of Johannes Mader. Right? So Mader is preaching from the Epistle Paul, the letter by this, this, um, this early founder of, of Christianity, and it's written from prison. And so Paul is writing in prison, and he writes this letter to this group of people, and he says, hey, just because I am a prisoner, because I'm a prisoner for the, of the Lord, I, on the basis of the authority of my humiliation here, I beg you guys to get along with one or approach one another, you, you Christians, in humility and gentleness and patience. Right. You've heard this one. It shows up in, in sort of uh, uh, literature about missionary encounter. The missionary is saying, everybody be humble. Everybody stick to stay in your lane. Everybody lay low. The missionary here is doing this and he's doing this from his uh, position of, of, of humiliation. But then the, uh, the first of the Ghanaian preachers gets up. His name is David Asante, and he's from the royal house, and he's one of the co-translators of this Bible. And he's preaching from this same book of Ephesians, but he goes to a different passage. Be strong in the strength of power. Put on God's armor so that you can stand up against the devil because we're not struggling against flesh and blood, he says. And then Asante puts the Bible aside, and he says, in you people, you indigenous people, you people who are here as seeking refuge here, grow strong in spiritual power and authority because one day these missionaries are going to go away, or if they go away, you need to be able to stand on your own two feet as new men, all right? So then Asante sits down. So the first guy says, be humble. The other guy says, grow strong in supernatural power. Then the third guy comes up, and this is a, a fellow named Elias Schrank, and he preaches from the book of Romans. And he says, turn your bodies over into as sacrifices, as living human sacrifices. All right, this is a figure of speech for the apostle Paul. It is not a figure of speech for the people gathered here. Many of these people had fled there in order to avoid being turned into human sacrifices. All right, but uh, Elias Schrank says, you know, preach, uh, be, uh, Lay yourselves down at the mercies of God. Present your bodies as living sacrifices. Now, bringing up the fourth, uh, fourth of these four preachers, you've got another Ghanaian, incidentally, a man named Clark, and incidentally, who was a native of this town in, in Tutu. And this guy goes back to the Old Testament. He goes back to the prophet Samuel, and he's instituting a new shrine in the face of a Philistine army. And the army is drawing near. And so they do a sacrifice at this shrine. And then the God of heaven's armies comes down and, and, and sends the, the, the army into flight. And so Clerk goes on to assert that God brings physical healing to the sick, power over evil spirits, and so on. So here you have four preachers, two Germans, two indigenous. They're looking at the same ancient text. The Germans, when they look at it, they see surrender, duty, humiliation, and death. And the Ghanaians are looking at this and they see autonomy and victory. So let me conclude. This is not far off from 21st century usage of the Bible in contemporary Ghana. And it's not only among the sort of flamboyant mega churches, but also among sober house churches and Bible studies. And it's not far off from Ghanaian gospel music, such as with uh, that uh, uh, Aaliyah began our meeting, which was a song about royal blood. It's a, a word play on the, the blood of a king, uh, the lineage of, of, a, of a matra clan, the royal blood in that way, and is a word play with the, the sacrificial blood of Jesus. So there's this, this, there's this language permeates contemporary Ghanaian Christianity. And this is because these ancient texts, these ancient Hebrew and Greek texts, are hermeneutically pluripotent. You can use them in different ways, uh, right? And so 
to treat the story of Ghanaian Christianity as merely a servile reception of an European imperial or slave trading cult is offensive to the incredible story of intellectual creativity now approaching its 200th anniversary. But it would also be to miss the story, the most best part, a story of marginalized people finding access to healing and power. And so that, with that, I conclude. Luis. Uh, well, thank you very much. That was a fascinating talk, brimming with, uh, with really um, interesting information, a lot of historical detail. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, we, I, we're, I think we have about uh, 10 minutes or so. We can go a little bit over uh, the allotted time, which is one o'clock, uh, depending on the number of questions. So you, there are several, you can just raise your hand and I'll recognize you and you can go ahead and ask your question or uh, you can submit it in the Q&A uh, option. I think you, you have um, and um, so I don't know if there are any questions or comments, would anybody like to Sure, is that um, somebody just came on? I just see an, oh no, okay. <laughs> somebody came on with a, with a number. Ali Cole, yes, go ahead, please. Ali Cole, please go, I think you're muted. Um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for this very enlightening talk. I mean, that, you know, answers a lot of questions that some of us have about uh, Protestant churches uh, in particular, but it's uh, it's also Catholic and perhaps all uh, imported uh, religions. And uh, you spoke of uh, a lot of the independence that uh, African churches have have uh, you know have taken. Uh, my question will bring you to the contemporary situation, as as I see it, and uh, that is of the power that these churches from abroad, from Europe, from North America, have retained in the contemporary situation of the vaccine against COVID. Ah. And especially the evangelicals, uh, including Pentecostal, uh, these churches still exercise a great deal of power, it seems to me, uh, you know, in resisting the uh, vaccine. Uh -huh. Through social media, disinformation and cons conspiracy theories that we, you know, we live with here have gone to Africa. Uh, now, when you look in terms of numbers, um, relatively, you know, relatively few Africans have died from COVID. And, and the reasons for that are not yet quite known. But these conspiracy theories through, you know, videos uh, and stuff like that, get there, and then the uh, Christians there return those, uh, uh, those um, theories back to Africans who live where COVID is rampant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell them not to trust uh, the, uh, the uh, vaccine because it's gonna do this, it's gonna do that, and they can only rely on uh, prayer and Christ and so forth. So I, I wonder if you can speak to that a little bit. I mean, there have been, I said, you know, relatively few, but but there is some very high profile deaths occurred. Uh, and the two that I, I think are most uh, recognized, are the presidents of Burundi in Kuruziza and the president of uh, Tanzania, uh, Magufuli, who died of, um, of, uh, of COVID while denying yes. that COVID exists. So, Yes, yes, yes. Um, you know, I'm not sure exactly uh, what to make of this myself. And this is an intimate problem, you know, in my own family uh, here and in my own you know, social circles as well. So I, I, I'm not sure what to make of this. Here's what I can say is that if you look at um, a um, chronology, and I didn't really get to this in this this story, I did, did make a, a little brief reference to this, which is that you have in this 
early in the middle 19th century, you have something that really looks beautiful. This, this, I mean, this, this genuine encounter and it goes away. And this is because these Basel missionaries late in the, later in the colonial period are going to throw themselves into the waiting arms of the British, right? And, and, and you see this, this real, this, this, this um, and the British aren't gonna love them. They're gonna kick them out with World War I anyway. And so you, you have this, this, this break here. And so thus when Pentecostalism arrives kind of in two waves, but basically in the 1960s, if you look at the institutional lineage, it, it's coming from overseas. And so it's only, uh, the question is, is there any kind of ontological continuity with what was going on before? I simply do not um, know what to make about this, this sort of circulation of, um, of conspiracy theories here. Although what I, one thing I will point out too is that the um, Pentecostals have uh, not just Ghanaians, but uh, have been doing this type of stuff uh, for, for, uh, for 100 years where you will actually uh, publish in newsletters a story of some healing and it will sh you'll ship it to you know to India or to chi China or, or to Chile and you'll read the story and you try to replicate it where in your local condition so so you, that predates social media by decades uh, but um, yeah I don't know exactly about the uh, um, how I haven't um, been uh, tracking with um, COVID basically I've been spending most of COVID trying to get my own kids not to fail out of their schools but <laughs> So yeah. Thank you. I think you're muted, uh, Luis. Thank you. I think there is one question. Um, TJ, would you like to ask your question or would you like me prefer to, uh, me to read it? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and... <laughs> Okay, I'll read it, thanks. Uh, so it's uh, TJ asks, in contemporary Ghana, are many Ghanaian Christians starting to favor the postures and sensibilities that you mentioned uh, have often characterized the European Christian approach towards the Christian scriptures, i.e. duty, self-sacrifice self -sacrifice rather than power and healing? Why or why not? Well, one thing I would say is that if you go to a contemporary uh, international conference, such as in, 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 in world Christianity or theology or so on, and you bring in people from all over the world, the Ghanaians are a very, very dominant contingent, very, very strong. And we're including uh, you know, all of the different, um, what, we, what we in the US would call mainline denominations and so on. So what you're dealing with basically is that Ghana, along with Nigeria, are basically one of the most sort of core regions in the transnational conversation uh, dialogues of Christianity in the present day. And so even though the hosts for these conferences will be at Edinburgh or Yale or Princeton, the intellectual um, dynamism is coming from Ghana and it's not restricted to, and Nigeria, not restricted to uh, the Pentecostals. And I would also add that there's a tremendous amount of, of dialogue and debate. And I've seen some of the most um, uh, sort of harsh, um, uh, pardon the language here, but a uh, uh, tearing somebody a new asshole type of, of, uh, of, of academic uh, teardowns. I've seen some of those things in, uh, in, by, driven by Ghanaian theologians in the present day. So it's a very uh, vibrant and at times contentious dialogue. And so um, uh, I think that you will find quite a bit of, um, of nuance and it's not all to be uh, that some of the, and this shouldn't come as a big surprise, but some of the loudest mouths and the biggest blowhards are the ones with the biggest presence on social media. Um, so, you know, um, I've always tried to nuance that with sort of asking people on the ground. Okay. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> Thanks. Um, any, any other questions or comments? We're, we're right at one, but as I said, if, um, since there are so many, or at one point there were over a hundred people present. Oh, there is one question, sorry. Um, uh, so the follow-up is, could you expound in more depth about how Ghanaian Christians uh, imagine their colonial past? To what extent is it seen as a valuable versus uh, as a negative part of their history? All right. Um, to do what I just said no, not to do, which is to make big sweeping, uh, sweeping uh, conclusions. Um, I, one pattern I do see is 
within the uh, contemporary Ghanaian theological scene is a great deal of resentment about the colonial past, a great deal of resentment, not only about the uh, contemporary uh, the, 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 the colonial past, but also with the institutional lineage. Why do we have to go to Princeton? Why do we have to go to Edinburgh to have our conversations? Why won't they come here to Accra and so on? And in fact, that's where some of the biggest pushback is, is taken. So there, there is a bunch of uh, basically a, 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 a justified anger mm -hmm. that is uh, about the, the Christian element here. And, but, and a good deal of, but a good deal of, um, of self-confidence. They're saying we do not have to, and, and you'll see many Ghanaian Christians uh, and the most prominent theologians uh, uh, might have been born with um, and given uh, uh, British names, and they no longer, the most prominent of these is Kwabi Nazimo Ajiadu, who, uh, you know, took, changed his name to, to an indigenous Ghanaian name. And you'll see that's, that's kind of stands in for a lot of the, uh, of the, the presence. Now, having said that, Having said that there's a good deal of sort of justified anger, there's justified anger at the Basel missionaries for a change in the weather from about the colonial period on, at which point the, 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 these German missionaries began to self-segregate from indigenous communities. And I didn't get into that because I was look. I wanted to, to not put the missionaries front and center. I wanted to put the intellectual history of the Ghanaians front and center. But the missionaries themselves had in, entered into a sort of genuine reciprocal rate relationship, receiving, you know, uh, medical care and so on, and, and, and for, for the first 50 years, and then segregated themselves away and began to act more paternalistically. And so there's justifiable anger at the British and justifiable anger at the sort of second wave of these Basel missionaries, uh, who then would get deported in World War I. And this is certainly the case in Cameroon. Uh, where the uh, Basel mission enters into Cameroon at the onset of German, the German colonial period. And so there was never this previous genuine encounter. It was, it was quite colonial from the outset. So the, the memory, if you go around rural Ghana, you will see in regular places, churches or even statues named after German missionaries. You'll never see churches or statues named after British missionaries. But if you look closely, the only people that they honor with these um, with these um, with these statues are the the first generation. All right, and nobody ever gets honored by from the low, low, later generations. All right. Well, thank you, um, thank you so much, Paul. I I think there is one more question, but I'm not sure. Um, unless it, I mean it. It's really, really quick because uh, I know that some of us have uh, meetings right after this. So uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. To, but <laughs> well, um, th yeah. there are there are people here who are taking my class uh, who I just were dialing in. And if you if you are one of those and you have a question, just email me directly. Oh, that sounds great. Thank you, Paul. Uh, my apologies again for cutting it short, but. Um, yeah. For some reason, this Wednesday is a particularly <laughs> busy day. Uh, this is my my second thing today, and I have a few others coming up. So, so thank you so much, Paul, for for this really enlightening talk. As Aliko said, um, just a lot to think about. Um, enjoyed it thoroughly, and thank you everybody. Uh, thanks everyone for attending and and for your questions. We'll see you next week. <laughs>